KUAM News Headlines is presented by Calvo's Insurance, serving Guam for 80 years. Happy holidays from Matson and the Adahi Itano program. May the magic of the season follow you into the new year. Cars Plus, reminding you to put your phone down while driving. Distractions won't get you there. Heads up, Guam. IP&E, fueling excellence. McDonald's of Guam, I'm loving it. And King's Restaurants, always open, always local, and serving up favorites for over 40 years. Starting now on primetime, the House votes to impeach President Donald Trump. Plus, former police officer Mark Torrey Jr. is back in court, and several residents in the village of Jotnia spoke out about public safety and a lack of a mayor during a town hall meeting held on Thursday. Afade and good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for streaming us on Facebook or watching on KUM TV 8. I'm Jason Salas, and we lead the newscast with national news as a huge bombshell out of the Beltway as the House of Representatives adopted two articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump, the first such impeachment vote in 21 years. Natalie Brown with CBS has more from Capitol Hill. Article 1 is adopted. The House voted largely along party lines to impeach President Trump on two articles, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Democrats argue the president pressured Ukraine to announce an investigation into his political rival, Joe Biden. We're talking about a president who subverted national security by soliciting foreign interference in our elections. The exact thing our founding fathers feared. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi solemnly opened the six hours of debate earlier today, which also unfolded along party lines. His actions warrant his impeachment and demand his removal from office. I am proud to have fought against this charade every step of the way, and I will proudly vote no today. Republicans closed ranks to defend the president and criticize Democrats. It's about power. Donald Trump has it and House Democrats want it. President Trump is only the third president in history to be impeached by the U.S. House of Representatives, and a senior administration official tells CBS News the president is upset about what this will mean for his legacy. The president railed against the impeachment at a rally with supporters in Michigan. They've been trying to impeach me from day one. They've been trying to impeach me from before I ran. The White House says it is ready to go however, whenever the articles of impeachment reach the Senate. Now, a pair of Democrats broke party lines voting against Article 1. One member of the GOP voted in favor of it. Democrat and presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard voted present. The Senate trial begins in January. Now to Guam news headlines now. Despite a last-ditch legal fight by a local resident, the federal cockfighting ban will go into effect in less than 24 hours. U.S. Magistrate Judge Joaquin Manabusan is recommending the court deny said Friedland Songen's attempt to stop the enforcement of the federal cockfighting ban. In November, Lin filed for a preliminary injunction asserting the federal ban violates the constitutional rights of the people of Guam, violates the Organic Act, and violates the people of Guam's right to due process. Lin Songen argued cockfighting should be considered a fundamental cultural right. Judge Manabusan has determined that Lin Sangen, who argued his case earlier this week, failed to demonstrate he'd likely succeed on the merits of his claims and therefore recommends the chief judge deny his request for a preliminary injunction. I was uh, very disappointed because uh, in the oral arguments of the defense, in his closing argument, uh, after that the judge said that he don't buy his argument. You know, I... That's why uh, I was surprised that uh, he uh, turned around and uh, denied my uh, re uh, injunction uh, request. And I was hoping that uh, he will grant it because with the way uh, he presided the meeting, the arguments. And uh, the only arguments that the guy said is the Congress has the full authority to uh, extend the bond to all the territories, which uh, I disagreed. And the judge said he don't buy that that uh, argument too. You know, uh, first of all, our our uh, rights are secured by the laws and constitution as is specified in the Organic Act. So they don't have full authority. You know, they, they need to uh, provide us the same right that they provided to Oklahoma and uh, Arizona to uh, propose an initiative for the people to vote or 
let the legislature uh, make uh, legislation to to ban it, just like the state uh, uh, in the mainland that don't have any initiative in their constitution. But us, we are protected because we have the Organic uh, Act. Judge Manabusen's recommendation to deny Lin Songen's request for a preliminary injunction is now before the chief judge of the district court. I'm giving a, you know, uh, all the chance to keep Judge Gatewood to do the right thing because uh, this is an injustice again created by the court. If his request is denied, Lin Songen says he plans to take his case to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But at this point, the federal ban on cockfighting is still set to take effect on Friday. And we stay with Island Court Matters as a trial date has yet to be set for murder defendant Mark Torrey Jr., who has asserted his right to a speedy trial in the second trial of his criminal case. And Judge Michael Berdalio is eager to have everything in order. Adriana Cotero has our next report. Okay, so then we're back to square one then. Judge Michael Bordalio says they are back to square one as the court orders both parties for a second time to file an official witness list. It's a matter of determining whether the witnesses are available, if prior testimony will be used, and the whereabouts as well as the competency of one important witness, Dr. Espinola, the former chief medical examiner. Number one, he's older now, four years older. I, 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 he was pretty old at the last one. I, I would venture to guess that absent him taking a week to review all the materials, he's not going to have any recollection. Um, I mean, again, that's, that's, I don't want to say speculation, but it's, it's you know, I, I would, I think everybody would be in agreement that it would be tough for, uh, what is he now? It's got to be 85 or 86. As this is the second try for the 2015 incident. In the amended indictment, murder defendant Mark Torrey Jr. is charged with negligent homicide and aggravated assault for the fatal shooting of fellow police officer Albert Piolo. Appearing in court today for a continued criminal trial setting, his attorney Jay Ariola says a main objection from their side. And Your Honor, I think the only witness that is in that position would be Dr. Espinola. And I think we have, we both have very, uh, differing accounts of the reasons why he would be unavailable or not. And, as and court, I mean, and that's kind of where we have to push it and so that the court, because I can't, you know, I don't, it, I don't, it sounds like a, at trial we're going to have, we're going to be hashing out what it is and I want to do that before trial. Judge Bordalio asked if there are other concerns and Chief Prosecutor Basil O'Malley airs one out. In reviewing the Supreme Court decision in this matter, uh, it's only a certain portion of the body cam that is, uh, Objectionable. So our intent is when we pay it at the points that the court has found objectionable, we're just going to mute the audio and we're going to continue with the video. There's nothing wrong with the video, it's just the audio of the state that we made. Attorney Ariola argues the video and audio was suppressed, however, only part of the body cam footage was. And Judge Bordalio orders the government to file a proffer by Friday the 27th, and for Attorney Ariola to file any objections by January 3rd. As for the questionnaire, both parties say it's near completion, as they are viewing one final question. I'm going to order you guys, I guess, we'll, we'll, again, one more week. I want you to, at this time, if, if you don't have a witness that you know is going to be here, then you're going to have to list them as a witness who, one, is either going to testify via video conference or, number two, is going to have to use previous testimony. I have to hear objections on that so we can, we can make a ruling on that to find out whether, you know, you're going to have to move Earth to find them. Or, or whether or, or what you're going to have to do if you know that they're not going to be allowed to testify via prior testimony. A return was scheduled for January 2nd for an update on the witness list. As for the body cam issue, Judge Bordalio said arguments will be scheduled for a later date. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. Dexter Long will remain in custody after a judge denied the defendant's motion for release. His attorney brought forth the potential third-party custodian to testify. The TPC has long known the defendant since 2016 and has been living in his residence since 2019 when Long was arrested. In court, the TPC is in a relationship with Charles Lacey, the person stated in the conditions for the release for the defendant to stay away from. Judge Joaquin Metabusin asked the third-party person if she has any rights to live in the home. She said no. 
Her attorney said, if Mr. Long told you he didn't want you to be there, who would you contact? She replied, Charlie. The government argued if a violation occurs, the third-party custodian has a bias and doesn't understand her responsibility. Trial was rescheduled to February the 11th. Well, a man shown on viral video with a large knife entering Sinanya Palace has been arrested. Sonic Ludwig is accused of calling out two employees to fight in the parking lot on Monday morning. He then walked inside, hit a grocery cart with a knife, and screamed he would kill everyone. Although Ludwig left, he was picked up in the Sinhana Gura Wednesday afternoon. He admitted he was drunk and, and may have threatened to kill everyone, but did not mean it. He also told police the pipe he threw on the ground when they picked him up was an ice pipe he used to smoke meth. He was charged with drug possession and assault. Well, a village without a mayor in office and no municipal plan planning council, despite the law calling for one. The vice chair on the Committee on Public Safety headed to Jonia to hear from constituents. Former Chief of Police J.I. Cruz was among those in attendance for a town hall meeting in Jotnia hosted by Vice Speaker Talina Nelson. I think there's a certain amount of vulnerability that the, the, that the village senses. Um, there's, no, there's no mayor, there's no leader. So who's taking care of those mayoral responsibilities? Jotnia Mayor Jesse Bloss has been locked up at the Hagatnia Detention Facility for the past three months and will remain there for another two until his trial in the district court. He's accused of extortion and accepting bribes from a confidential informant posing as a drug trafficker. Bloss is accused of allowing drugs to be smuggled in through U.S. Postal Service cluster boxes he oversees in his village. The vice speaker hosted the meeting to hear from residents' concerns about public safety and community welfare. And like the former chief of police, they're not sure who to turn to. And with students who will soon be on Christmas break, residents like Lily and Mesa are concerned about their safety. We are lost here in the village. I'll say that. Everybody says, we are lost. We don't know who to go to. And so for the protection of the youth, they're going to be out. Jonia has probably one of the best neighborhood watch uh, organizations in Guam. I mean, they have a very strong one. And I'd like to, uh, you know, you have a former chief of police here. We have 23 new recruits. I'll mention it to the, to the chief of police to make sure that Jonia is covered. But, like, but I, I want to commend that neighborhood watch patrol because they're one of the best on the island. And that's why probably you don't hear too much about Jonia as you hear from the other villages that do have a mayor. Former Jotnia Mayor Kenjo Ada was also among those in attendance, saying he offers a unique testimony about the village's strength in times of adversity. I'm 37 years old, and uh, it may not sound significant to you, but it takes 37 years to be 37 years old. I also learned in the four years that I was mayor that the village of Jotnia has resiliency. We fought each other, and we made up with each other because we're family, we're unique like that. They always joke to me before I ran for mayor that if you're gonna run for the mayor of Jordan, there's a few street fights you gotta win first. And that's how Jordan kind of rolls. And we like it like that. But we're a family of love, resiliency, and restoration. Currently tending to village constituents are the mayor's staffers, while Mayor's Council of Guam Executive Director Angel Sablon has been tasked with signing off on official documents on behalf of Mayor Bloss. Additionally, legislation is currently being drafted by Senator James Moylan to prevent what's happening in Jotnia in the future. According to the former chief, action needs to be taken to the next level. The discussions are being, you're hearing from the residents now, discussions are being, are happening down at the legislature. So we need to put that into action. We need to action that to figure out exactly how, we, how the village of Jonia can move forward. If there's any good that's going to come out of this situation in Jonia, is this situation will never happen again in any other way. New documents have been filed in the case against Jonia Mayor Jesse Blas. The evidence includes audio recordings of controlled calls, video recordings of bribe payments, WhatsApp messages, and photography. Some of the evidence dates back over a year as Blas has pleaded not guilty to the federal charges he faces. His trial is in February. And also tonight, former Governor Eddie Cavill and former public auditor Doris Flores Brooks have been appointed by the president to key posts within the administration. The White House says Cavill and Brooks were appointed to the president's advisory commission on Asian American and Pacific Islanders, joining 13 others who were likely to be tapped. 
The commission was established through an executive order signed in May to empower Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to improve the quality of their lives and to more fully participate in our nation's economy. Stay tuned. We're back after this. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now. Matson is in this community. We've been in this community for decades. We're going to be in this community for decades to come. Things will get busy, things will get quiet, but we're going to be here. We're your hometown carrier. And that matters to us. Reliability is the core of our business. We take pride in ensuring that we arrive in Guam on time as scheduled. It's our local employees who understand the market, who understand the business, and provide that a hard work for you each and every day. When we hold ourselves to high standards, our customers also hold us to high standards. We establish good business relationships that turn into friendships. That's why it's so important to be here and be trusted by your customers. We want you to trust Matson like your friend, like your family. Half the day, I'm in the club. Half a day, welcome to Two Lovers Point. Half a day, I'm in the club. Normal should never be abandoned, abused, neglected. 265 foster children on Guam have longed for family, clothes, and food. See their faces, hear their stories, be a foster family and bring them home where faith, love, and stability will change their lives. Please support the magic of giving this Christmas. It's a special delivery to your inbox every week with your KUAM News Roundup, program advisories, and promotions. Sign up for the weekly KUAM Digital Digest today on KUAM.com. Half a day, everybody. Downtown lawmakers are back in session today, and discussion on a new version of Bill 181 was shot down. Senator Teletai agrees motion to reconsider their action to place it in the voting file on Wednesday failed. As we reported, Senators, my majority vote moved a substituted version of Bill 181 to the voting file without any discussion or debate. The media was also not provided a copy of the new version until it was brought up on the floor. The original legislation covered the claims of about 700 war survivors at a price tag of about $7.5 million dollars. The new version removes that cap and instead will pay out claims to all living survivors that have been or will be adjudicated by the Foreign Claims Settlement Commission by the date of the enactment of Bill 181 into public policy. The governor has said that if lawmakers pass the legislation, she will sign it. As for H.R. 1365, Congressman Michael Sinicholas' bill to con correct a technical error to pay out war claims, there's been no word on whether action has been taken on that piece of legislation at this time. Well, this afternoon, the GOE head, GDOE headquarters at Tiedzen, an unveiling was held for the ISA League logo and presented to participating schools. Last Friday, the Department of Education's high school principal signed and ratified the new Interscholastic Sports Association constitution and bylaws at a meeting. It was then ratified by the superintendent, which was the final step in the process. Earlier this week, Superintendent John Fernandez said, quote, We're excited that this critical step has been completed and look forward to the third quarter sports season. Acting Sports Program Coordinator Al Garrido adds they plan to hold a second review of the ISA Constitution and bylaws over the summer in order to take into account any issues or feedback that may surface over the first few months of the sports transition. The ratified Constitution and bylaws can be found on GDOE's website at gdoe.net. Well, with affordable housing locally almost a non-existent factor, low to moderate income families will now have a shot at a place to stay as the Guam Housing and Urban Renewal Authorities and Catholic Social Services Cut the ribbon on Isla Apartments, a 14-unit complex in the central village of Mingilao. Here's Guru Executive Director Ray Tapasnik. CSS applied for a grant uh, sometime last year. The Gora Board approved it. It was about $750,000. So we uh, hired a contractor to come in and clean this place. This, this was a junkyard full of uh, uh, rundown or broken cars and metal debris. And we cleaned it all out and renovated the 14-unit uh, facility. 
The project includes major upgrades to include ADA-compliant access to four ground floor units, replacement of windows, doors, and kitchen cabinets and closets, also replacing interior plumbing for kitchens and bathrooms, retiling, hardening of exterior stale rails, stair rails, and balconies, among other items. Well, the Guam Regional Transit Authority's executive manager, Celestine Babauta, recently spoke before the mayor's council, hoping municipal leaders will jump on board with his plans to implement a new way for riders to purchase tickets. In the event that any of them would like to, to ride any of our buses, they can, they can purchase the tickets right at the mayor's office, so they don't have to go too far. Currently, uh, it can be a big challenge for some of our, our bus riders because they have to go to the ITC or, or the GRTA office to purchase the tickets. But now what we want to do is try to make it more convenient for our riders. Babata, who ran for senator last year, says the idea was prompted by riders, also adding that GRTA will work with the mayor's office to ensure a smooth process. Well, let's check out our friends at KSPN2 News now with a look at regional headlines. Hoffa Day Guam, here are the headlines for CNMI. Yes. Philip Minjola Long. Absolutely, yes. Janice A. Tenorio. Only yes. Motion carried. Members vote yes. Thank you, everybody. This morning, the Board of Education held their last special meeting to discuss the distribution of cash incentives for public school teachers. BOE Chairwoman Janice Tenorio explains who will be part of receiving these incentives. Today, we decided the uh, passing of the um, federally funded. Uh, programs for the uh, retention um, incentive uh, dollars, federal dollars, zero money to, to CNMI for teachers, um, substitute teachers, counselors, uh, librarians, and um, principals and vice principals. Those are direct contact. We also made a uh, uh, Member Long uh, made a motion to also include uh, part-time uh, teachers, so uh, Tim, our CIP, and the commissioner will be looking to that to get approval from the uh, um, from the federal for, from the federal grants. The retention incentive program recently received 1.3 million dollars for PSS teachers, teacher aides, counselors, librarians, instructors, principals, and vice principals. Tenorio says this federal grant does not include support staff, which was the cause of delay of the release of the cash incentive. But unfortunately, because, because the way the uh, grant is written and was received, um, uh, what do you call it, it only applies to direct contact uh, in educating the, the students. And um, the commissioner and the key staff and other board members and the board members as well and myself will continue also to look other incentives in regards to give to the support staff. One suggestion discussed will be granting support staff administrative leave which allows them to take a few days off during the school's Christmas break. But in regards to money as everybody always always needs money rather than day off and whatnot um, we will also continue to, you know, um, look elsewhere. Uh, federally money is somehow we'll try and see, keep, keep searching if we can get for the support staff. Tenorio says the reason why the BOE decided not to use local funds is because the timing is not right. We still need to maintain that manageable um, uh, funds to avoid pay list Fridays. There are over 400 support staff and eight PSS officials who will not be receiving incentives and including them will cost $536,000 in local funds. If federally funded money is available for the support staff then by all means automatically I know that it will not be a problem. That's why we were going in you know um, the votes were always kind of deadlock and, and whatnot. But I'm so happy today that um, out of the five, you know, four were a quorum and all four voted. Tenorio says teachers will be receiving an incentive of $1,000 this week and another $1,000 in June next year. From the PSS Board and Reading, I'm Salilimis reporting for KSPN News. For more news, visit SayapanTV.com. For KSPN2, I'm Ashley McDowell.
Back on Guam, a memorandum of agreement establishing a cooperative 2 plus 2 degree program in computer sciences was signed this morning at UOG's conference room for the president. The initiative allows for the full acceptance of credits completed by students who earn their associates in computer science from GCC should the student choose to attend UOG to complete their bachelor's degree. UOG Senior Vice President Dr. Anita Borja Enriquez says the partnership is simply beautiful. We're very grateful to uh, uh, our executives from the Guam Community College with President Okada and with our academic vice president, uh, Dr. Samara, and certainly with Dr. Michael Chen as dean, working in concert with uh, counterparts at the University of Guam to strengthen the meaning of our computer science degree by uh, engaging our students who want the, the, uh, the additional added value in a computer science uh, professional program by starting at the Guam Community College. It's a beautiful plan to get young minds into technology. Well done. The agreement was signed by, you probably saw, GCC President Dr. Mary Okada and UOG President Dr. Thomas Kreis. Well, speaking of computer science and technology, this Christmas, KUM and it &E are giving away the item on everyone's wish list, including Santa himself, the brand new iPhone 11. Now, whether you've been naughty or nice, you want to check out KUM, i94, and Uno on Instagram to see how you could win. Our handles are respectively KUM News, i94 FM, or Uno Magazine Guam. You can check out to see how you can win. And happy holidays from us at KUM and our friends at ITNE. Well, please stay tuned. Game Changers is up next with Dave Delgado. This holiday season, take a deal home at the Big Finish 2019 only at Cars Plus. Finish the year with the perfect gift under your Christmas tree. Take advantage of employee pricing on new Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. Visit us at carsplusguam.com. The name Regalu, or gift in Shamoru, represents the generosity in the hearts of all Guamanians. More and more of our children are being removed from their homes due to child neglect, abuse, or other hardship. Let's give these kids the gift of a stable and loving home environment. Please support Igume Menahasi, which will soon open its doors to serve as an emergency foster care facility. Help us give our children a safe place to go. Morning, two coffees and uh, four orders of those new donut sticks. You must really love these donut sticks. I do, but they're not for me. They're uh, for them. I will take a coffee though. Introducing new cinnamon sugar donut sticks from McCafe, made fresh every morning. It's a little sweet to go with your coffee. Mm. KUAM Sports is presented by Triple J. What's up, Guam? Dave Delgado here for KUAM Sports. Thanks for watching tonight on the show. We're going to take a look at this week's Gatorade Game Changer. Check it out. Season high wrestler Sakura Garrido picked up the sport after a visit with her doctor. As a freshman, she weighed 145 pounds and needed to make a lifestyle change. She was already playing volleyball and tennis for the Titans, but wanted to challenge herself even more. My doctor said that I was extremely overweight, almost to the point of obesity, and it was starting to like affect my health, like my triglycerides, and my lab work was really bad, and she kind of made me feel bad because it's something that I could fix and prevent, and with the history of like my family's health, it was like really starting to scare me, so it kind of opened my eyes that I needed to take some kind of action to fix myself for my future. As a freshman, she suited up for the volleyball team and played tennis to stay active and involved at school. The Titans placed third in the IIAAG Girls Tennis League her sophomore season. Sakura was hooked on wrestling after stepping onto the mats for the first time. Despite not winning any matches her first season, she stayed focused and continued to put in work to get better. It was kind of like my stepping stone into getting active. And then I kind of heard about wrestling from like my dad and then also seeing my fellow classmates uh, talking about it during class. It kind of inspired me and I thought it'd be kind of cool to try something new. And I figured it was a new challenge, so it would help me uh, 
with my weight loss further. Garrido went from 145 pounds her freshman year to stepping onto the scale in the 102 pound division this season. With two wins under her belt heading into the All Island Tournament this weekend, Sakura says she's happy with her progress. I think the biggest thing is the challenge because um, over the two months that we have in the season, you can really see the progress that you make through like, your body, but also your abilities through like conditioning, like how, how far you can run, how much you can push yourself. I think that was like the biggest thing, how strong I got mentally and physically. This year, Sakura traded in her volleyball uniform for a cross-country one just to stay in shape for wrestling. Garita will be representing her school in tennis and track and field. She takes honors classes and gives back to the island by helping out with coastal cleanups, taking pride in what she does on and off the mats. So last year, I wrestled at a higher weight, so it was definitely harder for me to play, so at least this year, um, I'm not really looking for gold for this year only because it is my second year and I'm trying to be realistic. So maybe just at least like second or third. Uh, I think it's important to really care about school because I've already been given the opportunity to free education. So by taking on the challenge of maintaining my grades, I think it's going to help me uh, with my time management skills as well as discipline. And uh, it helps me to set goals for myself for after high school and my career. Whether getting the job done in the classroom or making strides on the wrestling mats, Sakura Garrido is in control of her future and that's what makes her a Gatorade game changer. The executive team of Triple J Enterprises Inc. presented checks totaling $40,000 to six nonprofit organizations, Guam Cancer Care, Lupus Awareness Group of Guam, Boy Scouts of America, Chamorro District, Pacific Mission Aviation, Erica's House and Oasis Empowerment Center. Triple J Enterprises hosted their 14th annual Triple J Bubble Color Run on November 16th to raise funds for each organization. This run, touted as the island's happiest, most colorful and foamiest run, hosted over 2,000 runners and over 250 volunteers. Adulting isn't so 